All right, everyone, before we get into the episode today, I want to talk a bit about Access Protocol. They're built on Solana and solving the subscription problem in a crypto native way. We'll talk more about them later in the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Lightspeed. We are joined today by Offchain Labs, the creators of Arbitrum. We are joined by Steven, the co-founder, and Rachel, the tech lead. Um, and I'm sure the audience is super well-versed with what uh, a product like Arbitrum is. But just as a quick refresher, Arbitrum is uh, building roll-up technology uh, based around Ethereum, and it's well-known for its flagship L2 Arbitrum 1. Uh, it's an optimistic roll-up that uses Ethereum for DA and settlement. But there's also a roll-up framework called Arbitrum. Orbit chains that really let users kind of come in and create their own customizable L2 or L3s within this Arbitrum ecosystem. Um, so, Stephen, I think you, I think I want to start off uh, asking you just to, to explain the Arbitrum origin story because it has quite a long history, uh, for which is pretty rare in this industry. There's not that many like older projects that have had these ideas kind of been churning and, and ideating for for quite some time. So, love to just get the background on kind of how you and your co-founders came up with Arbitrum and, and how it's sprouted into the product it is today. Absolutely, and great to be here. So Arbitrum predates me, actually, in its initial phase. If you go on YouTube and look for uh, the first mention of Arbitrum, and you know, a few years ago, I would just say, go on YouTube and look for the only video that mentions Arbitrum, but thankfully, we're past that. Um, and you'll find a 2014, fall 2014, Princeton class seminar, uh, an undergraduate seminar. And there was a project, uh, it was like the uh, last video where teams were presenting their projects. One of them was uh, Arbitrum, which... Uh, um, was led by my co-founder Ed Felton. He was advising the students, and they built like a very early prototype of a bisection game, and uh, and and built this out. And the reason I like to mention that is because fall 2014 actually predates the launch of Ethereum. So in a very real way, Arbitrum and Ed really was thinking about the problem of scaling smart contracts before there was any real live smart contract system. It was a really an academic theoretical problem. Ed went off to the White House. He was the deputy CTO of the White House and senior advisor to President Obama. And Arbitrum kind of just sat on the shelf for a few years. Again, the other undergraduates did what they did for a semester. Everyone moved on. It wasn't quite a graduate level project. And then when Ed came back in, in 2017, that's when Harry and I knocked on Ed's door and said, hey, that Arbitrum thing, we should, uh, we should pick that up. Because in 2017, it looked like scaling was a problem. And I say it looked like scaling was a problem because now we laugh. I'm like, to see how how much more usage and demand there is now, but if you remember, like the Crypto Kitties era, that was around that time, and uh, we started seeing some some initial spikes of transaction volume, and it was clear that scaling was going to going to become an increasing problem. Right, one of two things would happen: either people would just stop using the technology, or they'd increasingly come to use the technology. We believe we believed in the latter, and therefore we needed to build the plumbing to uh, scale this. And so we picked it up in an academic context, but, uh, you know, building uh, graduate uh, work on this. And we uh, published this in the, in the summer of 2018 at Usenix Security, which is a, a leading security conference. That's also the month, uh, August 2018, was when we formed Offchain Labs. And none of us really had um, commercial aspirations or startup aspirations at the time. I was sure that I was going to go in academia. I, I had known that for many, many years. I was sure I was going to stay there. But of course, uh, as it's got more exciting, uh, we realized that we didn't just want to let others pick this up and build it. We thought it was really important. It was difficult to get right. And you know, time has proven that that's indeed definitely correct. And we wanted to do it ourselves. And that's why we did form the company initially as kind of like a part-time thing. Like, yeah, we'll do our academic things and we'll put a few hours in the company. That got very real, real very quickly. In 2018, we raised funding. And shortly after, we all joined full-time and uh, five and a half years later, here we are, and uh, Arbitrum is live, decentralized today, but Offchain Labs obviously still is a core contributor to the technology stack. Awesome. Yeah, I didn't know that, um, that it actually predates you. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. For um, So our audience is obviously maybe mostly, let's say Solana, and they're not too familiar with L2s and especially Arbitrum. So when you say this idea predates you, like what exactly is the idea? Like what was it that you saw that you're like, okay, we need to work a bit more on this. And obviously it was part-time at first, but then you decide you need to make a company out of it. Like what exactly is the concept there? Is it the concept of a roll-up, an optimistic roll-up? Like what is maybe um, just for people who are unfamiliar? Yeah, so one thing to note is back then, uh, the word roll-up in this context didn't exist or an optimistic roll-up in this context didn't exist. What we were trying to do basically, and if you look back at the Arbitrum paper, you won't find these words because they were 
they literally, you know, popped up uh, a few years later. What we were trying to do was a uh, scale smart contract platform. There was an earlier paper not written by us, um, which uh, mentioned something called the verifier's dilemma. I don't want to get too technical and academic here, but that was sort of uh, the initial paper that I think opened up Ed's eyes initially and my eyes and said, hey, uh, there's going to be a scaling problem when everyone's verifying everything uh, on layer one. There's going to be a, a problem here. And Ed's idea uh, was this... Uh, what we now call an optimistic, an interactive, uh, optimistic rollup, right? An optimistic rollup with interactive fraud proofs, but that you can minimize the work on chain, but still get a lot more done. And that was basically the core idea that Ed set out to build. At, to build, and we thought, hey, this is a really nice way to scale a blockchain like Ethereum. Um, and 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 the way that the initial Arbitrum paper was written, actually, it didn't talk about uh, Ethereum necessarily. It talked about some phantom layer one, because you know, in an academic context, you don't need to commit to anything. But from the first days of the company, when you asked me what we were building out, we were always building out something on Ethereum. We were big believers in Ethereum, uh, both from a technical perspective, but also from a community ecosystem perspective. You know, two different pillars that we really were excited about and still are excited about in Ethereum. We said, okay, we want to uh, scale Ethereum. We want to be the ones to build it ourselves. And back then, just to give a little more context, uh, I said rollups didn't exist, but there were other terms that existed. Uh, the two... Uh, dominant terms at the time when it came to scaling the two household names if there was uh if, if there was a household name would be plasma and state channels those were the two solutions of the day and i remember actually back when we raised funds for the company in 2018 investors saying like so is it plasma or is it state channels and we'd be like no it's it's arbitrum it's this other thing and you know fast forward we'd be able to say no it's a roll up it's a different category but we didn't have the vocabulary for that then and it sort of got almost to the point of problematic because people couldn't believe that there was another category that it completely different that we hadn't yet contemplated. And actually at the Cornell, um, I did a postdoc at Cornell at the time, at the 2018, I think, or maybe 2019 Cornell, um, they have an event every year, a, a boot camp for a week where like Vitalik used to come. And um, I gave a talk there and I my talk was Arbitrum advanced state channels because I sort of like like you know what I need to like take Arbitrum and put it in the terms of state channels because otherwise a lot of people won't pay attention and they're just convinced that it doesn't exist so I was able to use some of the terminology and back but it wasn't a perfect uh, perfect fit obviously I think the term roll up is much better um, but it's also just a good thing to to zoom out and like you know whether it's optimistic roll up ZK roll ups of today or plasma and state channels then I feel like people always think that we know at least the frameworks of everything we're not going to be surprised and I'm sure we're constantly going to be surprised and we have to keep innovating and, and keep uh, building to uh, as we increase our understanding, but not to sort of get boxed in by the limitations of what we understand today. Super interesting hearing the uh, the struggles of the industry's vernacular. It's, uh, that problem certainly hasn't gone away. And if anything, it's only continuing to compound. So uh, good to know that at least it's a historic problem as well. I, uh, I kind of want to get a little philosophical here maybe and just talk about the the end state uh, for the Ethereum's uh, roll-up uh, roll centric roadmap, right? And so if we think about Solana here for a second, you know, the goal or what Solana is really trying to accomplish is to build a single gl global atomically composable world computer, basically, right? They want that global permissionless state. Um, and that varies a little bit differently when you think about the Ethereum roadmap uh, that really has this roll-up centric future. And so could you just like talk to us a bit about how you see the evolution of Ethereum and really how you think Arbitrum fits into that afterwards? Yes, the evolution of Ethereum, you, you referenced the roll-up centric roadmap. This is uh, yeah, a, a blog post by Vitalik or a vision, I should say, laid out in a blog post by Vitalik a few years back, which um, basically says Ethereum will become roll-up centric. So roll-up is a system like Arbitrum. There are others as well, of course. There are now many. And the idea is that Ethereum index, you know, there's this uh, thing called or uh, the blockchain trilemma or the scaling trilemma. And the idea is Ethereum index really hard on security and decentralization, and it gives up scalability for that. Uh, can we, and we, you know, we can't be academic though and say, okay, we believe security and decentralization are the most important and therefore we won't scale because you have to also be pragmatic. If people can't use it, if it doesn't have the throughput to uh, meet the demand or the price just goes way, way up, that it just doesn't make sense to use it for typical applications, uh, we might sit in our ivory tower and say, that's okay because it's secure and decentralized, but that doesn't actually work. So we understand as a community, we need to scale as well. And the way that Ethereum scales was via this roll-up centric roadmap. And I, I love to point back to the roll-up centric roadmap because uh, it predates most of the L2s today. Arbitrum was already obviously building at the time, but it was a much sparser field. 
And uh, it really set in motion something that uh, we, we've seen really come to fruition. And there is a role of centric roadmap today. And I have a lot of respect for what the folks at Solana are doing. It's a different approach. You know, I can argue uh, why Ethereum's, uh, I, I think Ethereum is better. I'm sure we'll get into that today. Um, but that being said, um, I think at least to be true of like, you know, some of the criticism that comes out and says, oh, Ethereum, these L2s are parasitic to Ethereum because they have their own tokens. And I say, read the roll-up centric roadmap. It, Vitalik actually says in there that he thinks one of the benefits of this is that you have these sub-communities that have their own tokens and people can sort of peddle their own thing and it's actually really good. So, you can disagree with this and anyone can disagree with this, but I think the it's important to realize that it's, this is a fulfillment for the roadmap. There were there was a blueprint, there were plans, we follow those plans. We still we believe then as a community, and we still believe that this is the correct way to scale. Um, others will disagree and that's fine, but for other people to come in and say, oh look, these L2s uh, showed up, they have nothing to do with Ethereum, they're completely separate, they're parasitic. That to me is just like uh, dishonest because if you look back and all those criticisms that uh, people are, are lobbying, uh, lobbying out to, lobbying out today, were actually features that were set out, and um, I think we should at least acknowledge that and realize that. So I'm a big believer in the roll-up centric roadmap. I think it's a great way to scale, but the idea is that this is architectured and this is uh, the way that was intentionally and precisely uh, followed the path that we followed. All right, quick break from the episode here to talk to you about Access Protocol, the easiest and best way to stay updated on what's happening in crypto by following your favorite publishers. You can gain access to over 60 publishers, including CoinGecko, Crypto Slate, and a whole list of independent creators. Most importantly, you can also do this without managing a bunch of different subscriptions. We all know how painful that can be. So how it works is you find your favorite publishers, you stake the ACS token, that's the access token, and once you stake, you gain access to all of that creator's content without the hassle of ads or subscriptions that you can't cancel or lose track of how many you have. Access Protocol already has over 225,000 users that are finding new creators, reading content, and even receiving NFTs from their favorite creators. They're soon releasing V2, so check it out, the link in the description to go give the protocol a try. It's an awesome product, it's crypto native, and it's built on Solana. All right, back to the episode. So before maybe we get into some of the discussions around trade-offs, uh, I do want to actually slow down and describe how these things work, right? Uh, because there's some confusion there, especially, let's say, it's on the Solana side. Obviously, there's different types of roll-ups, um, and there's different trade-offs that each roll-up kind of makes. Um, you know, there's ZK, there's Optimistic, uh, there's even uh, uh, Sovereign roll-ups, et cetera. There's a few different types. So uh, could you describe just the general idea of rollups first and then uh, why Arbitrum picked the optimistic path and uh, let the nuances that come with that? Sure. So um, the thing that I think before we talk about optimistic and ZK uh, rollups, like the one thing that unites them all is the word proving. What I mean by that is the core. Uh, so we are we work in off chain labs and the core thing that we try to do is take a lot of the computation off chain. So it turns out that Ethereum has limited capacity. And our question is, can we like, better use the capacity of Ethereum and get more, uh, more mileage out of uh, the capacity of Ethereum and take more of that computation off chain? So you say, sure, yeah, just take it all off chain and do it in your own network. But no, the thing that we want, though, is we want Ethereum to still give its stamp of approval and say, hey, all that stuff that happened off chain, I, Ethereum, with my secure and decentralized validation, I stamp that and say that is uh, correct. And I and the end state that's uh, that's listed on Ethereum is actually the correct end state for all those transactions that happened off chain. And so how do you do this? You need some sort of magical thing. And that magical thing is called a proof. And what you do is basically you have um, this other network and its validators. Transactions are submitted off chain. In this case, we'll, we'll say to the Arbitrum network, but this could be any roll up. I haven't said anything about that differs optimistic and ZK yet. So you have this roll up L2 network, you send transactions there. And then they prove back to Ethereum what happened. They say, hey, Ethereum, I know that you can't possibly validate this directly, but I'm going to give you a succinct proof of what happened. And you can verify this proof and therefore validate everything that happened in a roll. So even though you couldn't possibly validate it all yourself directly, you can ver 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 verify this proof. That's true of all rollups. There's also a question of, where the transaction data is put. And that's sort of what we talked before about data availability. And the idea is that uh, even if we completely agree of how this machine works, there's some set of transactions and Ethereum can verify a proof and execute it. If you can't get to basic consensus of what the inputs are, it's going to be hopeless to try to get what the outputs are. So everything that I said so far is we have some set of transactions, they're submitted off chain, we prove back to Ethereum. But if we don't agree on like 
what not what we're proving, but like what are even the inputs? What are the transactions? We can't hope to get to consensus. And one thing that Rollup did, and this was in some sense a step back because Plasma, you know, these 2018, 2017 scaling solutions tried to take all the data off chain. Rollup said, hey, just put the, all the data on Ethereum. And that's how you get consensus. Just throw all the raw transaction data in compressed form on Ethereum. There's no question what the inputs are. All we need to do is this deterministic process. Take those transactions that are on Ethereum. There's full consensus of what those transactions are. Do execute them off-chain. And then we just have to prove off-chain, hey, that set of transactions that we all agree upon, this is actually the result of when you execute those transactions. And that's basically where data availability comes in. Um, data availability doesn't need to be put in Ethereum, but that's what a full rollup does. And that's how it leverages Ethereum security. So data availability has it, is on Ethereum. We know what the inputs are. Um, off chain, this thing happens, this process happens, it executes them, and it proves back to Ethereum what happens. And the way that ZK rollups and optimistic rollups differ in this picture, so far everything I said is applicable to both of them. The way that they differ is how this proof works and what this proof looks like. In a ZK rollup, it's conceptually simpler, but actually technically harder um, to, to implement. They give you something called the validity proof, which they say, hey, here is these transaction set that you know because they're on Ethereum. Here is the executed result. And here is this mathematical uh, zero knowledge proof. This will just take a black box proof that's like does some magic thing and it spits out a result and we can all trust it. So I give you a proof, a validity proof. When I submit the result to you, I prove to you right away that it is valid. An optimistic rollup takes a different approach as its name suggests, it's optimistic. So it actually comes and says, I'm not gonna give you any proof at all. Here is the set of executed transactions, uh, trust me. But it's not really trust me because there's a fraud proof process where if anyone disagrees, they can say, hey, Ethereum, and Ethereum here is just the referee. I disagree with that, and I'm going to give you a succinct proof or a succinct process in which you can prove that that is actually correct. And that's how these two differ, whether they prove that it's valid or that they assume it's valid optimistically and give you the ability to challenge that um, and prove that it's invalid. And in either case, Ethereum is the referee. It either validates the validity proof or referees the process of the fraud proof to get down to a state that everyone can say, okay, that is correct. And remember, this state is a representation of all those transactions that happened off-chain. So we have all the data on Ethereum if, if, or, or whatever data availability there you're using, but for a roll-up, you have all the data on Ethereum. These transactions get executed. It's a deterministic process, but even though it's deterministic, we still need the result. And we're doing way more than Ethereum can do. So Ethereum can't, can't compute that result directly. Now we prove back to Ethereum. It could be a ZK proof. It could be an optimistic proof. Maybe there's some other proving technology we can use in the future. But this is uh, the general uh, overview of what rollups do and how we scale. So I do have a few follow-ups there. Um, one, I'm curious, because you mentioned there's two proving systems. You guys obviously picked the optimistic uh, case. What, what is the kind of, um, what made you guys go with optimistic? I know from my bird's eye view, people uh, maybe think that ZK has more of a, let's say future uh, in once the technology actually gets there. Um, but you guys are actually, I, I believe you're the farthest progress uh, in, in terms of rollups on L2 beat. Uh, like some of these other systems don't even really have proofs currently, which you do. So uh, one, I want to ask why you guys picked optimistic as, as opposed to DK. And then two, um, I'm curious what you think about some of these other optimistic rollups just not having proofs in production um, and what you think that maybe says about the ecosystem currently. Yeah, so if you go back and look at my academic work at Princeton before Arbitrum, and you didn't know anything other than I worked at a roll-up company, you'd probably assume that I was building a ZK roll-up. Um, my PhD was in cryptography. I did a lot of work on MPC, multi-party computation. I wrote papers on proof system, on zero-knowledge proof system, on signature schemes based on zero-knowledge proof systems. So um, I definitely had no bias uh, against ZK proofs and probably was doing work in ZK proof research before most of those people building ZK roll-ups today, um, with some exceptions. That being said, um, when we sat down and looked at this problem, we said, okay, we need to scale uh, Ethereum today. And what is the best technology available to do that today? And it turned out for several reasons. One is cost. Uh, the off-chain costs in particular of ZK proofs were much more expensive than optimistic rollups. One is just flexibility and uh, the ability to actually support the EVM directly and also expand past the EVM. Rachel here is the tech lead for Arbitrum Stylist that enables other language supports, all of which, by the way, 
are going to test that today with full fraud proofs for wasm based languages as well. And, um, you know, that to us, flexibility, cost, and also the, the ability to build and execute were important to us. And we said, okay, we believe today, this happened in 2016, but it's also a renewed question today, that optimistic rollups are the best way to scale today. But it wasn't, you know, we're off-chain labs, the technology stack, the technology is called Arbitrum. You know, nowhere here do you see the name optimistic built in. As, whereas if you look at all our competitors, um, you'll find the name optimistic in their name. You'll find maybe the word, ZK or Snark or Stark in their name. And the idea was our goal is a set subtly different. We didn't come with a solution. We came with a problem and our, we said, we want to solve this best. I didn't come and say, I've built this optimistic technology, find me a problem. I didn't come and say, I built this cool proving system, find me a problem. I said, we have a problem. And we want to provide scaling solutions for Ethereum. And that leaves the door open, by the way, to future innovation. And that in that 2018 paper that I referenced, uh, the Arbitrum paper at Usenix Security, we had probably the innovation that got the paper published. The coolest thing in the paper probably was called the AVM or the Arbitrum Virtual Machine. And actually, Rachel did a ton of work optimizing some of the uh, AVM tooling when, when initially uh, when, when uh, Rachel joined the company. But the thing is, uh, in 2021, we launched Arbitrum with the AVM. In 2022, with the Nitro upgrade, we sunsetted the AVM and we replaced it with Wasm. And again, if I came with a tool, my tool would have been the AVM. And I would have said, hey, I spent years of my life, that and Harry, building this really cool architecture. There is no way that we're sunsetting this. That would have been what I probably would have said, but that wasn't our approach. Our approach was we're scaling Ethereum. The AVM was wonderful for its time, but it turned out we built a better approach and I was happy to sunset that in favor of something else. And if I look forward five years, that's going to happen again. And that's why it's so important that the technology is upgradable and the community needs to upgrade. Now, I haven't taken a bet though in what that will happen. Maybe we'll have a few breakthroughs of zero knowledge, zero knowledge proofing technology, breakthroughs which I believe are necessary in order to be competitive with Arbitrum today. And maybe that's the direction the ecosystem will go. Maybe we'll have breakthroughs like stylists that make us more entrenched in the optimistic uh, approach that enable us to do much, much cooler things there. I don't know exactly. I have some ideas, but we haven't taken that bet, right? If you come, you know, hire a plumber to fix a leak in your house, you don't want them to come and say, all right, I brought my tool. I'm fixing it with this tool. You want them to come and take a look first and see which wrench they need and which tool that they need. And that's the approach that we take here. So I'm not anti-ZK in any way, but I firmly believe that Arbitrum from a maturity, flexibility, and decentralization standpoint, right? It's mature and it's decentralized in ways that these other technologies aren't yet today. I believe that Arbitrum hits the sweet spot and provides scale to user users not in two years from now, that's often a perpetual two years, by the way, because it never gets shorter, not in two years from now, but today. And hey, in two years, will we have better technology? Of course, we have so many people throughout the ecosystem building and researching and contributing. Of course, we'll have better technology. And just like we swapped out the AVM for Wasm when that made sense, I'm not going to, you know, it's not my control, it's not the DAO's control, but I'll be a proponent to use whatever the best technology that we have today and to update the Arbitrum technology stack to that. Um, but I firmly believe, and it's not a decision that I made in 2018 and I haven't thought about since. We already made significant changes. I firmly believe that Arbitrum today, which has already evolved, is the best scaling solution uh, for Ethereum. I just want to bring up the second question again. Uh, you, you just mentioned uh, something that I find interesting, which is the two years, by the way, you said is kind of perpetual. Uh, so I want to double click on that, right? So you guys um, are, and I've been vocal about this. Uh, I, I generally say like Arbitrum is, the rollup that I actually uh, respect most because they actually have a proof system in place, uh, and there's things like stylus, etc., which which uh, give developers more flexibility. Um, I am curious, and um, I would say like some of the some of my peers are curious. There there are other there are a bunch of uh, rollups currently that just don't have proofs at all, right? So you kind of have an optimistic rollup, but then the proof system is missing. Um, what do you what do you think about that? Like, what is do you think that's acceptable? Do you think, um, is it a case by case basis? Like what are your general thoughts on that whole concept? So I think that different rollups will have different strategies of coming to market. So if you think that um, it makes sense for you to launch without proofs, I personally disagree. That was a red line for, for, for us. And this was like the core of the technology. We believe that it's important, but maybe someone reasonable can disagree and say, uh, we believe that it's okay to get the system working without proofs. The thing I really take issue with is those that don't have proofs, but also then you know are spending hundreds of millions or more dollars to get people to adopt this technology right away. 
And one of the early arguments that I heard against, you know, uh, I used to be a, you know, a big proponent, I used to be very vocal against uh, the anti-proof uh, roll-ups. And one of the arguments I heard is, you know, it's, they're gonna, the proofs are going to come and we trust them. But another development in the ecosystem is this idea that everyone should have their own roll-up. And I think for many, that makes sense. We have the arbitrary morbid technology, which gives people that ability. But now we're sort of um, giving other people the saying, hey, everyone should launch a roll-up without proofs. And this argument of like, trust them, they'll build it, you know, it kind of goes away a little bit because um, it, who are these people? I, I don't know. I haven't vetted every team. And so I think, you know, again, I, I'm not here to say that it's, it's invalid or you can't launch a, a roll up without proofs. I, it's not my approach. I think it's problematic. But I do think if that's the case, then you should say, all right, let's launch this alpha. And before we start, you know, pouring fuel on the fire, let's really uh, focus on the technical aspects, get the proof system in, and then we'll encourage, you know, people to start, you know, doing our incentive programs, or then we'll sort of encourage everyone to launch their own chain once these proofs are alive. Um, I think the combination of those things is, is, is troubling for me. Um, again, the reasonable people, reasonable people will disagree. I think that most people in this space have really good intentions. I don't think that this is like uh, anything personal against anyone. Just I think um, when you lose control of that and you sort of proliferate the technology too early in, a, in an early form, it's hard to uh, you know really know where it goes. And the other thing is, um, you know, the 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 analogy I like to give is also like a car or a car without an engine, right? In a lot of cases, places that that's what this looks like to me. And some people like to use the word modular to sort of tape over the fact that there, there is no engine. Now, modular is nice. The idea that, you know, the Arbitrum stack is very modular. There are many data availability solutions for example you can plug in. You still need one, right? So if I give you a car and I say, there's a gas engine and there's a, um, an electric engine, you can actually plug in whichever one you want. It's like a super cool car. That's great. But if I give you a car and I say, it has a hole for the engine, you can plug in whichever one you want. And you say, okay, well, how much is the engine? So, well, I actually haven't built any engine yet. Like that to me is more problematic, but I think it actually creates problems later on potentially because maybe it turns out but for technical reasons, I don't know today, the engine is going to have to be circular and I left a square hole, right? Until you really know in Arbitrum, because the technology is built out, we, we know what the invariants are. The invariant is, you know, when we build stylus, the proof system cannot be broken. And we know that, and we know where our walls are. We can walk into the walls, and Rachel can talk about this a lot better than I can. You know, we might walk into the wall and say, oh, that would have been a good idea, but it turns out that there's some subtle interaction that would make proving harder if we did that. If you don't know where the walls are, you're probably going to trample all over them. And I think adding proofs into a legacy system becomes uh, a potentially more difficult and might lead to more disruptions in the network. Again, that's not necessarily the case. Maybe you had really good intuition of where the walls are. So I'm not trying to say that this will for sure happen to any team. Uh, but I do think it's harder to, as you innovate in other areas, it's harder to sort of keep track of what you can't break when it's not there. I'd love to touch on that too. Like, um, we do take a very different approach in terms of just having everything be, um, you know, fully compatible and, and all the, you know, proving and decentralization factors that we have never taking a step back on those. Like, Stylus could have shipped last year if we just didn't care about fraud proofs, right? Like if we were just like, hey, we've got this really exciting um, virtual machine that lets you run, you know, smart contracts written in languages like Rust or C or C++ on Arbitrum 1. If you don't have to do proving, you know, your time to delivery is just way lower. But we actually took the effort and the time and the, and the you know, energy and all that to, to build a system where on testnet today, you have the same level of fraud proving that we do on Arbitrum 1. And and that's really important because as Stephen was touching on there, and I think this often gets overlooked, so I just want to want to talk about it again, it's just the, the choices we were making at all of the steps in the Stylus VM were directly informed by the fraud proving system that we have. Like there were so many very subtle choices that we could have made that would then have created quite a bit of technical debt or headache later on if we were to say, okay, we've got this awesome system, let's figure out how to prove it. And like, it's extremely technical to understand why that's the case, but that's actually the crux, right? Like, because it's so technical, you can't predict this stuff way in advance, right? You can't say like, oh, well, two quarters from now, we're going to go and implement this this thing and and hopefully it'll happen to cover all of the assumptions that we baked into our virtual machine. Um, so. Yeah, it's it's something we're always going to do. It's why the arbitrary DAO is self-executing, and why um, 
you know, every time we have like a big upgrade or change that it's not changing the security assumptions, um, the only changes we make are to progressively move closer towards full decentralization and all of that stuff that we think is really important. Um, and yeah, I think I think that's one of the reasons why Arbitrum is the number one roll up today. Um, you know, if you just look at all the metrics, like people have been choosing this over um, over alternatives that don't have the same security assumptions because um, it's just a lot of money at stake and a lot of people's, you know, assets and stuff. So very important to get this stuff right and to, um, you know, be able to credibly deliver on that decentralized vision that, you know, L2 scaling is all about. So talking about um, the, let's say, trust or, 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 or trade-offs that people make when it comes to decentralization security, uh, I want to talk about DA uh, very, very quickly. Uh, you mentioned a bit earlier in the podcast that like a full roll-up uh, post data to Ethereum right, uh, uses as a DA layer. Obviously, 4844 is coming out, which will uh, improve things quite a bit. Um, there are open questions as to whether that'll be enough. Um, you know, assuming maybe there's some surge in demand and maybe the fees kind of go back up again, uh, at which case maybe some folks will prefer to use something like a Celeste shop. What are, you, what are your overall thoughts on alt DAs um, with the context of rollups? Would Arbitrum ever use something like this? Um, and what are kind of the different trust assumptions that you're making as soon as you start posting data to another DA layer that's not Ethereum? Yeah, so there's actually a few, like we were talking about the um, Arbitrum stack being modular against data availability solutions. Um, for the full decentralized, or I shouldn't say really decentralized, for the full security, um, you know, point along the trade-off curve, um, post the data to Ethereum is the absolute, right? Like, the idea is then that anyone who has an Ethereum node and who can participate in an Arbitrum fraud, fraud proof, um, you know, challenge protocol, um, they are able with Ethereum alone to figure out what the inputs are to the system. And when doing a fraud proof, you have to actually know what those inputs are. So it's very important in whatever um, way you set up the Arbitrum stack that it's possible for those who want to perform fraud proofs to be able to actually access the data necessary to construct them. So Ethereum's the obvious choice if, if security is number one. And, um, you know, that's why Arbitrum One is, is using Ethereum directly and doesn't use um, another solution. But it's not the only way that you can, you can set things up. Um, you know, previously, right, if we think of like, you know, what technologies have existed in the past, the alternative to this, to save from pay posting all of that data to Ethereum might be to maybe you post a commitment to it and you kind of run a side chain on the side and you use some kind of um, majority consensus algorithm to say what the next update should be and all of that. But um, what's really cool is there actually exists a security point in between these two extremes. So on one end, you have like a side chain where, um, you know, things are not really secured by Ethereum. And then you have on the other side, um, you know, the actual full fraud proof optimistic roll up um, construction where it's all Ethereum, right? So it turns out that it's possible using um, what's called the Arbitrum AnyTrust technology to um, create a roll up where the data is stored somewhere else. And the idea being this, you can have something like a data availability service. Um, it could be on Celeste, you could be on, it could just be the one that, um, you know, we've actually written uh, that uh, Arbitrum Nova uses. Just the point is to have like a set of nodes. And so long as an honest minority of them is willing to provide the data, um, you're able to secure that rollup or you're able to secure that chain. And this is actually very nuanced, but it's very important because it dramatically increases the security versus something like a side chain. Um, while, you know, still and, and therefore still maintains a lot of the security um, implications that we would want in these kinds of technologies. And how it kind of works is this. So um, the idea is this, if you have like in uh, data availability nodes out there providing, um, you know, data as a, as a service, so long as in the Arbitrum Nova case, that's this is how we've configured the parameter. So long as two of them at least are honest, um, it will always be possible to perform um, to be, to perform fraud, fraud proofs, and that's important, right? We're saying two of n. So if there's n data availability nodes in this in the service, um, so long as two of them are honest, which is a minority, right? For you know insufficiently large, um, you'll be able to actually construct the data. Um, if it turns out that 
you know, only one of them is honest um, or, or less than that, the security assumptions change a little bit. Um, in certain circumstances, you instead fall back to roll-up mode where you post the data to Ethereum directly, which means things get a little more expensive for users because the you know data is actually on Ethereum. Um, the only scenario where this, or the reason why I talk about there being a security trade-off is the following. If 100% of the nodes are N minus one of the nodes, so um, you know if, if only one is honest, it's possible to uh, for them to collude together to just withhold the data and you know therefore uh, you know not allow people to actually perform fraud proofs. And that is a that is a security change, right? Like that is not the exact same as a roll up where anyone, right, one of them, if so long as there's one person out there that's honest, they're able to um, you know read the L1 Ethereum state and then perform their fraud proving. Um, it is a little different, right? Because you have these nodes that are not Ethereum, right? Um, that are also not just general validators. These are data availability committee service providers. Um, but still, the point is, is that like, this is a much better trust assumption than just a side chain, right? Where it's like, so you're going to need like two thirds honesty or something like this. So it's very subtle, but the idea is that for ultra, ultra low fee use cases where uh, primarily, by the way, before 4844, because that's going to change the picture a little bit. But um, for for those use cases, right, like gaming or whatever, where data is just too expensive, right, to make that marginal increase in security worth it, uh, we've con- made this construction. And what's cool is now it's not just a model that's on top of the custom data availability service that we've written. Um, you can actually do it on top of your favorite one, right, like Celestia or what have you. Um, and yeah, so those are the trade-offs. It's, uh, it's a nuanced technical decision, but the cool point is that using these technologies, we can have a much, much safer experience than, than like a side chain or what have you. Yeah, I appreciate the thought that has clearly gone into how the the Arbitrum framework allows you to build with these different layers. Um, I want to jam on the idea. So you mentioned 4844 there. This is the, an Ethereum upgrade coming that will create blobs for Ethereum blocks um, and is expected to reduce the cost of posting DA to Ethereum by roughly three to five times. Um, still TBD on how that looks in production, of course, but that's the best estimate as far as I'm concerned. And, and please jump in if that's an incorrect number there. Uh, but I, No, I just find it so funny that people are spending so much energy. I'm like, just, just wait a month. Like, why, like there's so much, like, it's just like the topic du jour of like, let's estimate it. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I am just going to, I'm just going to see it come March. <laughs> hey, the, the crypto's use case is speculation. And that doesn't, uh, that doesn't, the Ethereum upgrades don't get a, a pass on that one. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, so I, basically where I'm going with this is 4844 will reduce fees. But if you look at something like Celestia, which is live and in production today and being used by a number of rollups somewhere on the order of about 10 to 15 active in production, uh, we have Eigen DA or Eigen Layers data availability offering coming in the very nearish f- future. <laughs> for we'll take that for what it's worth. Um, then you have things like Near, which are trying to kind of lean into this DA narrative as well. All of those options that I just mentioned are either significantly cheaper than Ethereum today, um, or expected to be if they haven't launched yet. Uh, but on the order of about Celestia is about a 99% reduction in Ethereum mainnet today, and it will still be an order of a magnitude cheaper uh, than what's expected from 4844. So how do you, um, you know, as, as the core contributors to Arbitrum, think about the trade-off of offering users lower fees? Because what the cutting DA costs ultimately means cheaper transactions. Yeah, it's, it's actually a very important question. So like we previously discussed in technical detail, like there is a slight security trade-off you can make to get a huge reduction in fees. What this just means with 4844 is that, um, you know, Going with roll-up mode is actually going to be even more competitive, right, with uh, these less secure solutions. So um, what that means then is with 4844 Live, the trade-off between Arbitrum, uh, you know, with with full, uh, you know, posting data to Ethereum um, versus, you know, um, other solutions, it's just going to be less valuable to make that trade-off in terms of security. Now, some use cases are so price sensitive that that's still really worth it. You know, it might be the case that, you need fractions of fractions of cents and stuff. And so it's vital to use some other data provider instead of Ethereum itself. But the point is, is that like, um, you know, this is a, this is the kind of very, um, you know, this is the kind of decision making process that is up to the chain. And, um, I think both are pretty reasonable. It's, uh, it's, it's so much better, right? Than some kind of side chain scenario. But in terms of like, um, y- y- to answer your question too, in terms of like the, um, 
you know, how we think about these trade-offs. Uh, the, the fact, right, that we're so security minded here in terms of the choices we're making, um, kind of shows where our values are in it, right? Like to us, it is very, very important to cut fees, right? It's why we research technologies like Stylus, which are prov providing like order of magnitude improvements for a lot of compute use cases and stuff, but never without actually trading off too much security or any, if it's possible, right? So like there's things that Ethereum could have done. It could have made uh, the amount of data that's allowed to be posted much, much larger. And I guess this actually would be worth talking on. Why is it the case that people can't predict what the reduction is going to be in terms of fees? It's because it's a market, right? Like Ethereum has only so much capacity for posting blobs, blobs being the, you know, units of operation for actually doing this, um, this data stuff. But there's only so much capacity for it. Um, and that means then that based on the demand and that capacity, which you can think of as kind of like a supply curve, the two of them together determine like what the market price is for that data. Well, if Ethereum were to just like 10x or 100x the amount of data, right? Um, well, okay, right? Like now all of a sudden fees are going to go way down because the supply will be higher. And um, if the demand is the same or similar, well, that you should expect, right? Like that the market price is going to fall. And um, but Ethereum chose a very conservative amount of data that they're letting through. And I think this was very reasonable, right? Like it's, um, it's important that nodes be, um, you know, cheap to operate and that the, um, you know, accessibility of actually, you know, participating in these ecosystems is, is as low of a barrier of entry as possible. And so Ethereum chose a really low constant for it. I still think it's going to be, you know, extremely amazing to see the fee reduction that we get from it. Um, but, you know, there is talk of increasing that amount as well. And what we'll just need to see is over the coming months, like how well do the, how well does 4844 uh, perform and lower fees? And as we I mean, don't get me wrong, so much testing has already been done on test nets and all of this. So it's not like we're just figuring out in real time how well the system works. But the point is, is we'll see what the market looks like. And then the Ethereum community in a decentralized manner may choose to adjust how much um, how much data is allowed to go through. Um, so it's nuanced, right? It's economic. It's got all those factors in there. But if it turns out that Ethereum is just a little too, um, you know, like that, that it targets just a little too much security and decentralization. Um, it may make sense for uh, certain chains, you know, certain orbit chains perhaps to choose uh, any of the data availability solutions that you've discussed for their marginal improvements in terms of, um, in, in, in terms of fees. So um, yeah, that's kind of how I see it. Um, but I think both are very reasonable approaches for any chain that someone's making. Um, the the only thing that I wouldn't do is a side chain, which is why um, which is why that's not how the Arbitrum tech stack works. Anec anecdotally, by the way, the way AnyTrust came around was it turned out that for certain projects, primarily like social products, projects like Reddit, this was came up in the context of Reddit, which was one of the initial users of Arbitrum AnyTrust, as well as games. Like even if you're ninety five percent cheaper than Ethereum, uh, it just was too expensive. And so as people would ask me, like, why, why did you create any trust? It's like a, a lesser security model. And the answer was because you have to be both principled and also pragmatic. And I said, when I would speak to people, I would speak to game developers, I would speak to social uh, app developers. They weren't saying, okay, if Steven says so, I guess I'm going to go on, on, on Ethereum or I guess I'm going to go on Arbitrum 1. Like, I, that's, that's what Steven says. No, they were saying, well, this doesn't work for me and I'm just going to leave to some other ecosystem, like a side chain, like Rachel said. And they'll have much worse security. So our question was, can we take our technology stack, you know, par uh, parameterize it in a way such that they'll still have a really, really good deal of security, will be a lot better than the alternative they're going to go to, and still be able to leverage a lot of that security? The answer is yes. And that's where any trust came in. So, you know, it wasn't like it was our decision, like, oh, we're pushing people away from rollups. No, we never suggested that DeFi moved away from rollups because the price point there for, for even moderate trades makes sense. And even moderate sized financial transactions make sense because if you're doing even like a ten dollar transaction, your fee is a you know a couple of, of cents. That's fine. That being said, if you're a game and uh, you know a couple of cents fees doesn't work for you, you're not going to say, "Oh, I'll go there" because you just, your business won't work. And our 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 goal was, how can we cater to these people and give them a much better option than the alternative that they are otherwise going to choose. That, that's actually yeah, really important is like that philosophically of like meeting users where they're at. Like if there's an application that's only possible at a certain fee rate, we need to provide the most secure technologies that we can 
to make that stuff more viable and possible. Um, it's, it's the same reason why, like with Stylus, that we've introduced support for extra programming languages, right? Like developers out there don't know Solidity or um, actually there's a funny stat on this. Like there's about 20,000 Solidity devs out there. Uh, meanwhile, there's like 12 million C and C++ devs. And so when you think about it, like um, there's quite a barrier to entry into Web3 if somebody just wants to use Solidity or what have you. And, you know, there's solutions to using other other languages like Rust on Solana or um, other networks or what have you. But if you want to actually like ha tap into the liquidity of Arbitrum or um, be in the Ethereum space and have, you know, your adapt written in Solidity, like talk to another written in Rust, um, the thing we're building right here makes that most possible. But in terms of the values, the reason I brought it up is that, um, you know, if there's a use case and it requires a certain fee level, we want to um, we want to provide the best technology that could plug in at that spot. If there's, um, you know, something that's been, if there's a really popular game uh, who, that has components written in a cool language like C++, we want to provide uh, the tooling and infrastructure that they would be able to actually go in and build on top of uh, on top of our technologies without these huge hurdles. And so that's that's kind of the way to see it. And at the same time, right, Ethereum's making improvements and 4844 is coming on. And it may be the case that sometimes uh, it'll make sense to instead say, actually, look, it looks like, um, you know, the more security is worth uh, the amount of cost increase because the amount of cost increase went way down, right? Um, but it's just up to the application. It's up to user preferences and um, and the just security assumptions people are willing to make. I want to maybe shift gears a bit and talk about sequencers. So I've recently been interested in the concept of base rollups where the L1 kind of does a sequencing as opposed to the sequencer on the, on the, on the rollup. Um, I'm curious... And I've seen some disagreements on on CT about this. Like, do sequencers actually need to be decentralized, right? Does that really matter? Some people say yes. Some people say actually it's not necessarily or necessary. Where do you guys fall on the spectrum here? What do you, what do you think about decentralizing sequencers um, and just your general overall thoughts around maybe base rollups as well? Yeah, so another term that didn't exist in 2018, but if you look at the initial Arbitrum paper, it was a based rollup. There was no sequencer. The sequencing was done by the L1 inbox. I don't know if that's, that's an idea that sort of reemerged, but actually, again, you can look at the published 2018 paper, and this was uh, what you call today a based rollup. So the sequencer only came uh, into the Arbitrum technology stack uh, post paper, post company when we were building. That's, that's just one historical note uh, of interest, which I think a lot of people don't realize. Um, I'll say something general, and then maybe I'll, I'll uh, move over to Rachel. She has more uh, technical and specific comments, but I think that um, it really depends. People mean different things when they say centralized sequencer. Uh, back to our fraud proof conversation, if you don't have fraud proofs live, then the sequencer becomes a dictator, right? Because a sequencer can uh, do things like take money out of your out of your wallet. Because whenever it posts, those state routes are just fact, accepted. There's no uh, way to challenge the sequencer. It can post bad transactions. It can do all sor sorts of nefarious things. And that's a very big problem. Uh, in Arbiter stack today, the sequencer is minimally trusted. It can't post uh, bad state routes because if it tries to, it does not, doesn't make sense. It's not even the one that tries to, but you know the validators are the one that keep, that keep it honest and make sure that those would get challenged and the right thing would happen. So the sequencer can't touch user funds. In fact, the Arbiter sequencer is so, uh, is so uh, trust minimized in most ways that uh, it's not even trusted to give you the L1 gas price. It has to get that from on-chain. And the reason is because if it can, it can basically just say, hey, the price went way up and just sort of artificially change things. So we've tried to, in, the, in its design, minimize trust in the sequencer. Now, the one place it, where the sequencer is still centralized and trusted is exactly that sequencer sequencing the ordering of transactions. And that's the way, and that's the place uh, where sequencing still needs to be decentralized. Um, but it's, I'm not trying to minimize that problem, and we're actually, we're actually working on that. We're working together with Espresso on building out these centralized sequencing solutions. We could talk a lot more about that. I'm not trying to say that's not an important problem. But what I am trying to say is uh, people, I think, often assume the former because there are roll-up stacks out there that are completely centralized. So they think if you have a centralized sequencer, it means you have this party that can do all sorts of bad things. They don't think that, oh, everything is, is cannot be done by that party. The only thing they can do is uh, reorder transactions or sensor transactions. Now, so let's just get into that for a second. So what can a, a centralized sequencer in an arbitrary technology stack that has decentralized validation do? Well, they can choose the ordering of transaction and manipulate that. 
But very importantly is you do have an on-chain option. So if the sequencer is trying to censor you long-term, right, not real-time censorship, and that it can do because it can delay you, but if it's trying to actually censor you long-term, it can't do that because you can go ahead and post your transaction on-chain and the sequencer needs to include that. Um, that's one thing to notice. So what we're really talking about is causing delays and also reordering transactions or ordering them according to its will. So if you think about that, it's not too worse than any other you know, Ethereum or any other blockchain today where the current block producer has the ability to choose transactions and to order transactions in its blocks as well. It's a little bit worse because that's typically for blocks at a time and it, and it rotates, whereas here you have a party that has this, a long-term control. So you know, I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but I think reframing like that um, is important. We're doing a lot of work to decentralize that um, but actually I'll say is there's not even consensus in the community what it means to decentralize the, the, the sequencing because there's not consensus in exactly what the correct policy is. You can have first come, first served, centralized or decentralized. You can have, on the other hand, the full out auction where you just sort of auction out um, the ordering, whoever pays most gets ordered first. You can do that centralized or decentralized. And there are very two different objectives here. On, on the first one, when you're doing, talking about first come, first serve, when you say decentralized, you're thinking about some moral quality of, I believe that they should have some fairness property uh, guaranteed. And the second one, you're saying, I don't really care about the fairness property. I just want it decentralized um, and therefore then the chain getting more, more profit from this. So there's not even exact uh, uh, consensus of what it means to decentralize, what the objective is. In our case, what we're pushing is something called time boost which basically is uh, as a policy, by the way, but again, time boost can be centralized or decentralized. The policy that we uh, like is called time boost, which um, has a sweet spot of one, not allowing front running uh, on the chains, uh, but also allowing uh, small priority gain, uh, gains auctions for, for back running. So the idea is you can get a little priority by paying for it if you want to uh, get a transaction in sooner than others, but you can't see the mempool. You don't, you don't can't know what you're, what you're getting ahead of. Um, and, also, number three, the core tenet is not degrading the typical user experience. So a user just wants to get their transaction in, just wants to mint that NFT or you know execute that trade. They're not, they're not going to have too much delay. They're not going to have to wait perpetually. They'll have a bound, a very, very tight bound of the delay that they'll get. That's what. We're, but again, that's uh, completely orthogonal to centralized or decentralized. So zooming out, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think people often think of centralized validation when they say centralized sequencers. And to be fair, there's good reason why people think that, because if you look at our competitors, they have centralized validation and centralized sequencers, and there is no validation. So they just lump them together. And the arbitrage stack, I think a lot of people's core concerns of like, oh, this is terrible because it's centralized. No, 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 that's not true. It's decentralized validation that takes care of that. The sequencer can't do any of those nefarious things. Yes, it can reorder transactions. Yes, that's not the best thing in the world. And therefore, we are working together with Espresso to build decentralized uh, versions of validation, decentralized time boost, for example, like taking this policy and build a decentralized version. And that's, I think, very important to say, okay, you don't have to trust a centralized sequencer not to reorder, not to censor for uh, short periods of time. You actually have a guarantee, a decentralized guarantee of that. But again, I think a lot of people don't realize that, okay, we're not talking about this, we're talking about this. Yeah, and to, to expand on that slightly, um, yeah, the, there's so much confusion because people don't understand the role of the sequencer, as Stephen pointed out. But, um, and, and yeah, like when people, most of the time when I've heard someone say, I think it'd be important to decentralize the sequencer, they think what we mean is like validation or something, right? But I think a really important thing to just realize on a technical level is the sequencer in the arbitrum model, this is not true of, uh, of, of other chains, right? But in the arbitrum model, the sequencer orders inputs, right? It doesn't produce outputs. It doesn't say like the state root on, a se on Arbitrum is now this. It doesn't like have that kind of edict where it's able to just say the balance in your account is that or you signed this transaction. It can't do these kinds of things. And as Stephen pointed out, it can't even know what the L1 gas price or rather it can't like lie about the L1 gas price. And that's a huge difference compared to, to other chains where the sequencer can kind of just make up whatever value it wants. And, uh, you know, even if there's some bounds, the point there being, um, you know, we've really tried to make sure that the sequencer is as minimal of a layer in this process as it could be. Um, and it's why technically, like, you know, thinking about the technical stuff on chain, um, there's actually two inboxes in the Arbitrum model. There's an inbox where the sequencer is posting its sequence of transactions. But then there's also the delayed inbox and that's on Ethereum. And so like if you're being temporarily censored from um, 
you know, posting or the sequencer won't sequence your transactions or whatever. Like you can go straight to Ethereum and say, okay, here's my transaction. Uh, run this in Arbitrum. And what's cool is after a little bit of a delay, the sequencer will eventually be forced to pick that up. And when I say be forced to pick that up, I mean in terms of smart contracts. The point is that like nodes in the network that are reading the input see that in the delayed inbox in the order of transactions conferred by that user force, including that transaction, as it's called. And sequencer does the inputs, validators produce the outputs, and that's the dis that's the separation here. So there's a separation of concerns. Now, in terms of how important it is for us, even though it is so minimal, we are decentralization maxis, right? Like our whole goal is that every component would be decentralized. It's why the Arbitrum DAO is self-executing even, right? Like there's no like, um, you know, we, we actually have an on-chain process for voting for upgrades that takes, you know, effect on a code level. It's not just, we all promise that something that people vote on in, in snapshot becomes what the chain is running, right? Like it actually is decentralized on a smart contract level. And like we want that 100% of every component of our of Arbitrum would be like that. And so, yeah, we definitely need to decentralize the sequencer. We think it's really important. Um, it's it's more important for other people where the sequencer does more powerful things, right? But nevertheless, if there's even one component that's that's a bit centralized or more centralized, one hundred percent needs to be decentralized. So, um, yeah, that's 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 why the emphasis on 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 uh, decentralized sequencing in our work with Espresso. Cool. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I just have one question left. Uh, I'm just personally curious. I know we're over time. Um, there's a lot of uh, talk about the future of kind of the module roadmap. And maybe one realization of that vision is there's hundreds, maybe thousands of rollups. And there's a lot of, you know, cross-chain interoperability and aggregation and all this stuff and abstraction. Uh, and then there's kind of maybe a, a bit more traditional view, which is like, okay, Maybe like two or three rollups really dominate everything, right? Um, wh which, which, what is your personal beliefs on this? Which do you think is is more likely to happen, and which do you think would be better for Ethereum? I really like the rollup centric roadmap. One reason is just um, you have independent teams innovating, right? So it's not like there's one core dev group that kind of makes all the decisions on what it means to scale the network, right? Like there's us working on. Um, you know, like all this WASM technology where, you know, we're trying to provide all these new programming languages and the scaling, the Arbitrum and the decentralization entailed with it. Like we have our model for it and it's an optimistic roll up in all of the stuff that we discussed uh, in, today, in, in today's episode. But um, other people have different visions, right? Some people want to go the ZK route. Um, and like, like Stephen said, not to preclude us from ever one day, you know, changing to whatever the best technology is, um, even though we maintain that right now, the best one is optimistic. Point is, People can disagree with us and they can actually go and scale Ethereum in their own way. And the market can, can uh, figure out over time, like, you know, what the best way is. And I think um, I think that's really important to the decentralization of a large ecosystem like Ethereum, that there would be the opportunity for anyone to spin up a roll up and say, here's how I think it should work. So it may be the case that in the long run, there's like two or three really solid designs that tend to, you know, dominate. It could be the case that there's a lot of small rollups, right? Um, especially as app chains and use cases in that kind of world become more popular. But um, the point is, is that like it's open, it's permissionless, people can build on top of Ethereum and scale it. And um, and yeah, we're really, really, you know, happy that Arbitrum exists and is right now the number one. But, um, you know, we look forward to all the innovation that that's, that comes from this uh, from this market. So. Yeah, and I totally agree with all that. Just to add, I guess, slightly as well is an analogy I've used in the past here is like to TV channels. I know it's a dated analogy, but the idea is that like, I do think there's going to have to be some consolidation, right? So it wouldn't make sense. On the one hand, you can't have one TV channel for everything. Obviously, you need more than that. Does it make sense? On the other hand, though, like for every TV program to become its own channel, it doesn't make sense either. You'll have like most of the day, no programming. Everyone will have to negotiate their own distribution deals, their own advertisement deals. Like it would be a nightmare. And I think um, one thing that we're, we are seeing emerging, particularly the Arbitrum Orbit stack is themed chains. So not necessarily every game has their own chain, but like game distribution platforms having their own chain. And there might be a few of them, 
right? There might be a few cable news channels, but like they're all themed and they sort of, um, you have a de destination. It's great because, you know, your users are there. They, there's discoverability around the same uh, network. There's ease of moving over. There's liquidity. There's just uh, a community that, that builds there. Um, but I do think that, you know, it's, it's will be sort of almost like a self-charted vision. So you'll have your gaming uh, focused chains, you'll have your NFT focused chains, not to say there'll be no general purpose chains, but to this extent, there'll be many, I think there will be, have to be consolidated around, consolidated around a vertical rather than an, every application on its own. And, you know, there'll be some gray area, right? You can have a TV show. That's a cartoon about nature that could go on national geographic and it could go on the cartoon network. And like, it's sort of up to you and, you know, you might have ones that you're surprising and you, you'd expect them to go elsewhere because it's all sort of self-chosen. But the idea is that um, I do think there will be consolidation around particular verticals. And that makes a lot of sense because there will be good bridging. There is good bridging. Bridging will get better. Users will be able to jump back and forwards. But for a user that's like primarily a gamer, it's great for them to be in one or two or three gaming chains. And that's where they can tend their focus. Sure, they might want to eventually bridge over and do a DeFi transaction. That's fine. Um, but also when it comes to like paying security, because that's the other aspect here, which is you sort of paid for shared security of the application that you're chain. If I'm a gaming user, I, I don't really care about the DeFi applications and don't necessarily need to pay for them. And I don't, I'm never going to use that app. And why am I competing with you for block space? I'm just going to get frustrated because there's a big NFT mint on this chain. And I just want to like do my trade and like, why is everything more expensive now? So I think there's a lot of benefits of this consolidation of this sort of specialization and consolidation. And that uh, would be my guess. Uh, so I think it's probably, to, you know, to be specific, um, m many more than three, but I don't think there are going to be uh, thousands of, of large, uh, large roll-ups. There might be these specialized, you know, short-lived things, but I think there will probably be uh, tens or so of uh, very specialized per, uh, per application roll-ups. And I think you'll have your general purpose, you know, high liquidity chains like Arbitrum 1 uh, leading the way um, and, and dominating the market as well. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And as a closing question here, just because you kind of alluded to it there, you mentioned bridging. So one way to think about this is, you know, like Amazon, Stripe, uh, Shopify, all of these like consumer checkout experts have put thousands and thousands of resources and, and, and hours of work into analyzing the like checkout flow, if you will, of what a user does. One extra screen, one extra second of load time one extra process flow. These all kill conversion and there's a lot of great data supporting that. If you think about a user that needs to move between two different chains, there is that extra step of you have to bridge and it does take time to get that transaction completed. And the other piece here is the bridge transaction itself is not like the user's end goal, right? If they want to move from chain A to chain B, it's to perform some activity on chain B that doesn't exist on chain A. I'm just curious to get your perspective on the ZK side of this because there is some indication that ZK will enable this more of a richer bridging solution where if you have the same proving circuits and you have the same uh, shared bridge contract, you can move assets between two different chains uh, that are, are leveraging both of those same pieces of technology. Is, is that something that you guys have thought deeply about at Arbitrum or are you still kind of thinking that that's just a potential evolution of this? And again, you know, your previous comments were like, we'll use the best technology is that once it you know comes to uh, maybe get a little more battle tested. So that for sure, like um, I'm going to say some things that maybe are a bit like uh, negative on that, on some of the, of the state of, of that, those things today now, but um, that's not negative fundamentally. And if there is a ZK based bridging solution or a bridging solution based on any other technology, that's clearly better than what we have today. Like I, I would, uh, I would like that. And I would say, Hey, how can, how can we build uh, that? How can the arbitrage community adopt that? Like that would be at least my personal uh, viewpoint. But I think one thing is that a lot of these ZK solutions sort of uh, talk around and wave their hands around is um, the timing for these things to come. And there are two things that I'll mention timing. One of them is uh, fundamental and one of them is not fundamental but they're both there today. The not fundamental one is a time to generate these ZK proofs, right? So a lot of people like to talk about this idea, uh, these designs that assume that every transaction comes with an attached ZK proof. And look, you can just send this chain, that chain, and it knows instantly, everything's instant because the chains are just in real time proving against each other. In reality, um, and teams have come a long way on this and they'll probably continue. That's why I say this is not the fundamental problem, but it's the reality today. Um, chains take minutes to hours to a day, uh, if you look at the live ZK rollups uh, today until they su submit and confirm proofs. And that's uh, the reality. And 
The other thing to say is if you're like a user of these tra- chain, it's really a binary thing. There's instant and there's not instant. And what I mean by that is if I tell you you can come back in an hour versus come back in seven days, or you can come back in a day versus seven days, that's a lot better. But you don't want to wait an hour. So you're probably going to anyway need a liquidity bridging solution like Hop, like Connext, like a centralized exchange. You're probably going to bridge that gap uh, to be uh, to use the pun anyway. And you're going to use something else and you need those solutions. So in the case where you're not instant, Yes, a day is better than seven days. Yes, an hour is better than seven days. I'm not going to argue with you that on that, but you're probably still going, the real-time users, the traders, you know, the funds are in and out of their wallets well before the hour came, well before the seven days came. Uh, and the second one, though, which actually is fundamental, is the settlement time of Ethereum comes into play here. So even if you had your instant ZK proofs, you need to sort of put these transactions on chain. You need to commit to what are the transactions on the chain in this chain? What are the transactions on that chain? Because the chain can rework. Right, the chain can. I can tell you, hey, chain B, look, these are two of the transactions of chain A, and oops, actually, we reorg that transaction. That transaction is gone. Uh, we have a different transaction. It's fought, they're reordered, and the problem now is uh, the fundamental one is it takes Ethereum twelve to seventeen minutes or so um, to get to finality, and that's just a, a fact of, 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 and that's not going anywhere. So even if you have everything else that you can control, instant. While uh, consensus is not uh, is not instant and won't be instant, you have to wait that period of time, and that's something which I think doesn't get talked about enough. And people just assume that everything's going to zero and everything's instant. And again, this comes back to my initial point, which is the instant crowd is going to want a solution, and those solutions are going to look a lot like optimistic roll-up bridging today. Awesome. I love that perspective. I appreciate that. Well, Rachel, Steven, this has been a fantastic conversation. I appreciate all you're doing to push forward the crypto ecosystem as a whole and doing great work at Arbitrum. Uh, But thanks again for joining us. Cheers. Have a great rest of your day, guys. 